These days, electric vehicles are a hot topic of conversation, as we have a growing number of brands like Tesla claiming that their EVs can help stop climate change. But are fully electric cars really any better for the environment than petrol or hybrid cars? This video is going to dive deep into the topic to find out if EVs are a realistic choice for environmental action or just another consumer fad. The answer, it seems, is not that simple. If you're like me and you need a new car, you might be thinking of going electric to help the environment. And with all the new models out there, we're really spoiled for choice. Additionally, many governments are phasing out the sale of conventional cars, so EVs are becoming a more attractive choice. But it's not clear if going electric is actually making a positive impact on the environment. The three most common concerns regarding EVs are 1. Doesn't manufacturing an electric car produce loads of emissions? 2. Is mining for lithium bad for the environment? And 3. Isn't it more efficient to burn fossil fuels directly in a conventional car rather than using them to generate grid electricity to charge EVs? We're going to answer all of these questions in this video and use the answers to analyse the sustainability of popular EV models, so watch till the end to see if your favourite EV is helping or hurting the environment. To do this, we're going to go through what's known as a life cycle assessment. We're going to keep it really simple by only looking at the data and sticking to the facts to draw our conclusions, no political or economic agendas. We should also mention that we will only be using scientific sources, and we'll put all our citations in the description, just in case you wanted to look into this further. The life cycle CO2 footprint of a car depends on two main factors. The emissions from vehicle production, and the emissions from vehicle use. Firstly, the emissions from vehicle production vary greatly as there are lots of different types of cars, but many studies report that on average, manufacturing a conventional car releases about 7 tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions. This is actually roughly the same for EVs, if we don't include the battery. But if we do include the battery, we can see that electric vehicle production can have more than double the greenhouse gas emissions for manufacture. According to a 2019 study by the Swedish Energy Agency, the materials extraction, transport and manufacture of a lithium-ion battery emits 60 to 150 kg CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour of battery capacity. This means the bigger the battery, the more emissions it produces. If we take a median-ish value of 100 kg CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour, we can calculate that an additional 3 tonnes of CO2 equivalent is produced for a low capacity 30 kilowatt hour Nissan LEAF and 7.5 tonnes for a high capacity 75 kilowatt hour Tesla Model 3. So we can say that across the board, manufacturing EVs creates more greenhouse gas emissions than manufacturing an internal combustion car. But why does making a battery produce so much greenhouse gas emissions? Manufacturing EV batteries requires huge mining operations to extract the elements they need such as lithium. Now lithium only counts for about 1% of a typical EV battery, but the extraction and refining of all the other materials accounts for over 60% of greenhouse gas emissions for making the battery. A side note here, there is a big problem with mining cobalt which counts for about 3% of the battery. The Democratic Republic of Congo is a major exporter of cobalt, producing 70% of global supply and they have been found to use artisanal mining, which encourages child labour to produce as much as 30% of their cobalt. This is more of an ethical issue than environmental, but it's worth knowing as cobalt is used in all portable electronics. Aside from the ethical problems, the environmental impacts are clear. Manufacturing EV batteries is an environmentally destructive process, and the larger the electric vehicle's battery, the more production emissions are released during its manufacture. But there is one more variable in our equation, emissions from vehicle use, and this is where things get really interesting, because now we'll discover how electric vehicles really compare to conventional internal combustion cars. To figure this out, we need to compare the fuel cycle emissions of EVs and the fuel cycle plus tailpipe emissions of internal combustion cars. Fuel cycle accounts for any fossil fuels burnt in the production of electricity for an EV, or the refining and transportation of petrol for a conventional car while tailpipe refers to the emissions released in burning fuel in a conventional car. This brings us back to question 3. Is burning fossil fuels directly in a car engine better for the environment than burning them in a power station and transmitting it to your EV? The answer is no. Simply because power stations are way more efficient at making power than car engines, including transmission losses. Additionally, a country's energy grid doesn't have to be 100% fossil fuel driven. With increasing drive for decarbonisation, countries are becoming more and more reliant on renewable energies, with renewable electricity production growing from 19 to 28% in the last 10 years. 
This is reducing the greenhouse gas emissions of every kilowatt hour of electricity produced in the grid, making electric cars more sustainable every year. This is fascinating because every country has a different energy mix, with different ratios of clean and dirty energy production, which we'll discuss in our upcoming series. We predict that owning and charging an EV from dirty electricity might cause more environmental harm than using a normal petrol car. Of course this is highly country dependent, but what we found out is that there are only two key factors determining whether an EV is sustainable or not. So keep watching to find out if it's a good or bad idea to buy an EV in your country. As our interest is on cleaning up the environment, there is no point considering internal combustion vehicles with above average CO2 emissions. The average European car has a manufacturer determined tailpipe emission rate of 165 grams of CO2 equivalent per kilometre. Adding in the inefficiencies of real world driving, we get total greenhouse gas emissions of 31.3 tonnes of CO2 equivalent over the lifetime. We're assuming an average lifetime of 150,000 kilometres of driving. Let's add in the fuel cycle emissions. Based on the energy mix of the average EU member state, this comes to 3.75 tonnes. Now we have a baseline vehicle to compare against, we'll be comparing our average conventional car to various popular electric vehicles, as well as the most efficient internal combustion engine car, the Peugeot 208 1.6 Blue HDI 100, and one of the most efficient hybrid cars, the Toyota Prius, aka the standard taxi driver whip. To do all these calculations, we're going to use Clamobile, a tool built in 2019 by the Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology. This tool considers all the parameters required to provide a complete life cycle assessment of any make and model of car. These calculations depend on many factors we haven't discussed yet, so we'll quickly define them now. First off is battery performance due to temperature, which we set to 0.8, giving us a realistic 40% swing in performance from summer to winter conditions. Battery recycling emissions are set to zero, as there is currently no widespread solution to recycling old cells. Most countries are pledged to have carbon neutral electricity grids by 2050. To achieve this, we'll need a decarbonisation factor of 0.33, giving us 33% of decarbonisation every decade for the next 30 years. Using the average EU energy profile and plotting the total life cycle emissions of our EVs over their 150,000 km lifespan, we see that the emissions mostly depend on the fuel cycle and battery size of the car meaning that the manufacturer and model make a small impact on the emissions, but the energy mix of your country and maximum driving range you choose makes a large impact. And these make up the two key factors everyone needs to closely consider before buying an EV. So how do you think these EVs are going to stack up against their fossil fuel counterparts? Well it turns out that using an average EU energy mix, every single one of these EVs produces less emissions over their life cycle assessment than any fossil fuel burning car even the behemoth 75 kilowatt hour Tesla Model 3. In fact, an average 40 kilowatt hour EV produces about 25% less emissions than the hybrid, 30% less than the most efficient internal combustion car, and less than half of the emissions of the average internal combustion car. Of course, this is all hugely dependent on the energy profile of your country or state. To keep things simple, let's take the standard 40 kilowatt hour Tesla Model 3 and compare its emissions in different countries and states. Pause this video to see if the Tesla is sustainable in your region. We see that in all cases, the EV is more environmentally friendly than the average petrol car, but not always better than the highly efficient Prius and Peugeot 208. But these are rare cases of heavily fossil fuel dependent grids. So assuming you live somewhere that has a good energy mix, how long would it take for an EV to have less lifetime emissions than a petrol car? Well this depends on how much you drive. Using the average EU energy mix, and the average EU annual mileage of 12,000 km, we see that after 4.5 years, a brand new 40 kWh EV pays back its battery manufacturing emissions and produces less overall lifetime emissions than the most efficient petrol car brand new. This is also true for the average American mileage of 20,000 km, with the EV producing less emissions after less than 3 years. Of course, if the petrol car is second hand, then you are not contributing to the manufacturing cost but a brand new EV would still produce less emissions over its lifetime, even though it would take a bit longer. So it seems that trading in your petrol car for a brand new or secondhand EV does actually save tons of CO2 emissions, literally tons. And if the EV lives longer than the 150,000 km lifespan, well then you saved even more emissions. The caveat to all of this is that if you live in a country or state with a dirty energy profile, then buying an EV could cause more harm than good. However, research has shown that there are other benefits to the electrification of transportation, such as lowering fossil fuel dependency, 
raising environmental consciousness and reduced air pollution in urban areas. In addition to these benefits, it's incredibly important to support and even campaign for decarbonisation initiatives to make those dirty energy regions more favourable for EVs. Renewable energy is expensive to set up, but once the infrastructure is built, it can supply cheap, clean energy moving us towards a sustainable, zero carbon future. Lastly, it's important we all choose an electric vehicle with the appropriate range to suit our lifestyle, to avoid producing unnecessary battery manufacturing emissions. However, the biggest complaint about EVs is their range, but how far do you actually drive on a single journey? For the United States, the National Household Travel Survey showed that 95% of non-commercial trips are shorter than 48 kilometers, or 30 miles, and only 1% of trips are longer than 70 kilometers, 44 miles. Similar results are found in the UK and EU, so a small 30 kilowatt hour Nissan Leaf with an average range of 225 kilometers, or 140 miles, is more than sufficient for the vast majority of car journeys that most people take. Additionally, rapid DC charging ports are only becoming more and more common in every service station, and they can charge most EVs completely in less than an hour. So with current technology, there is really no reason to fear getting an electric car based on range. And when this pandemic is over, and you do finally go on that road trip, you can be assured that after a tiring 150 miles, you can plug into a fast charger and have a short, well-deserved rest, maybe with a nice cup of tea. Thanks so much for watching. If you're interested in supporting this channel, you can do three things. Firstly, you can subscribe and click the bell icon to be notified when we release a new video. Secondly, you can share this video with friends and family and on Reddit and social media. Lastly, you can comment below climate action ideas and analysis you'd like to see in future videos. Look after yourselves, each other, and most importantly, the planet around you. Thanks again, R. Eden.